all the glory to Jesus again once once again give him glory give him thanks and honor uh, bless the name of Jesus this morning I was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the Lord this is the house of the Lord even though we get a chance to collaborate via the technology that God has given us nonetheless God is there with you wherever you are you may be in your home you may be on your computer driving or whatever whatever you're doing god is there with you because his presence fills the whole earth our god is omnipresent hallelujah we want to thank god for the opportunity to to fellowship with one another this is church at hero smart and uh, we are going to have a grand time in the presence of the lord hero smart is a ministry set up by god for the discipleship of the nations in keeping with Yahushua's instruction in Matthew chapter 28, which says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you to do. And the Bible says, Surely I will be with you till the end of the age. That instruction in Matthew chapter 28, the body of Christ is called the Great Commission, and indeed it is a Great Commission. But that great commission has two parts to it. He has the first part of getting people baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, essentially getting them born again. And the second part of it, which involves the teaching aspect of the people that got born again, is just as important as the first part of it. But the second part has been de-emphasized in the body of Christ significantly for about 2,000 years. And that spells the reason there is not a lot of growth in the body of Christ. You can hardly tell right now between a Christian and a non-Christian because they are not growing up out of carnality because there is no teaching in the body of Christ significantly. So in keeping with that instruction to disciple all nations, God has put the charge on this ministry to emphasize the second part of the discipleship program and put the necessary emphasis on the first part as well. And in keeping with that instruction in Hero Smart, we carved out a curriculum that we may be able to, to, to use to do that very well. We are going to start with the emphasis of the teaching aspect of the discipleship program and fall back on the getting people born again part of it as your discipleship mandate as you are coming to the end of this session of the ODP program. So the ODP is a curriculum that God has helped us to put together in this ministry and it is a curriculum that may be, may be classified into four major categories. There is something we call the pharmacy section of the Word of God, the milk section of the Word of God, the meat section of the Word of God, and the water section of the Word of God. And in coming through this session, since 2017, we've gone through the pharmacy section of the word, we've gone through the milk section of the word, and we are right now in the meat category of the word God. And we are going to try to further the meat aspect of God's word today, which the meat aspect of God's word are going to be certain aspects of the word of God that will help us to function as the priests and the kings of the New Testament understanding how to pattern our lives after the operation of the tabernacle of Moses, which God gave Moses an instruction to build based on the pattern of the heavenly tabernacle that was shown Moses on the mountain back over 4,000 years ago. The Bible says that we right now serve in that heavenly tabernacle, so the priestly instructions back in the Old Testament are going to be applicable to your life as a Christian in 2018. If you understand the spiritual significance of those physical ordinances, you will function as a priest of the New Testament, and subsequently you will function as a king of the New Testament, and that's what the meat aspect of the Word of God is going to be all about. So we've come through the different series of the meat of the Word of God. We've come through spiritual groceries. The hope of our salvation, the faith of a priest, the tunic of righteousness. And I thought we were going to be done with the tunic of righteousness last week. And God says there is another critical component of the tunic of righteousness, which we need to talk about. And we are going to title today's message as the tunic of righteousness part four. Hallelujah. The tunic of righteousness part four is what we are going to be talking about today. And specifically, we are going to be talking about your Sabbath rest. Hallelujah. There is a Sabbath rest that God plans for you to have as, an, as a believer in Yahushua. We want to title this message today, Your Sabbath Rest. And it's going to be 
the tunic of righteousness, part four. Hallelujah. Uh, there is a Sabbath rest that God has in plan, has in mind for you. Hallelujah. Your Sabbath rest. So when we're talking about your Sabbath rest, you, we need people to, to appreciate that we are going to reference certain scriptures in the Old Testament to still appreciate the importance of going on a Sabbath right now in the New Testament. There's lots of people think the whole testament is done and over with, just like we can see all through this this the series, especially of the midsection of the word of God, those instructions are shadows and types that we need to pattern our spiritual operations based on. And it behooves us in this generation to understand the spiritual import of those physical ordinances back in the Old Testament so that we can stay on the wings of victory, even on the side of eternity in the New Testament. Your Sabbath rest. Firstly, the reason we need to understand that going on the Sabbath is going to be part of your spiritual tunic is because of a scripture uh, that the Bible talks about with regards to tunics. And I, I came up with this equation this morning. Um, I, call, I want to call it the, the tunic equations right in here. I don't know if you guys can see it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, um, to send you guys to study notes so you can see the print on the board properly. Hallelujah. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 19. Hallelujah. And in verse 6, we see another description of the, the, the fine linen that we can call tunic over there. And how operating in certain wisdom strategies of Jesus will pass for the operation of the fine linen tunic. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6 it says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. F fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints of God. So you got a pen in your hands written through the paper copy, copy of the Bible. Underline the word fine linen over there. Fine linen is going to be equivalent to the bride's righteous acts to prepare herself for the Lamb's wedding. Hallelujah. So the Bible says the spiritual implication of being dressed in fine linen or when you are operating in the righteous acts that God is talking about here with regards to getting yourself ready as a bride, of the bridegroom is going to be to be dressed in fine linen. And when you're dressed in fine linen from top to bottom in the Old Testament, based on the evidence of Exodus chapter 28 and verse 39, that is what the tunic is made of. Let's turn back to Exodus chapter 28. And see what the tunic is made of so you can appreciate what God is trying to get us realized with regards to the spiritual implications of the linen tunic. Exodus chapter 28 and in verse 39. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. 28 and 39 of Exodus. Exodus 28 and verse 39. It says, weave the tunic of fine linen. Hallelujah. That answers your question over there. So when the book of Revelation, Revelation 19, is talking about the bride getting dressed in fine linen, you can say the bride is going to be dressed in woven tunic. The spiritual implication of that. Hallelujah. So fine linen tunic is going to be equivalent to the bride's righteous hats to prepare herself for the lamb's wedding. So the question you may want to ask yourself is, what are those righteousness actions that the bride of Jesus, whom you are, whom I am, that I need to dress myself to be ready for the wedding or the marriage supper of the Lamb? What are those righteous actions that we need to imbibe, which are going to be the spiritual implications of the fine linen talked about in Exodus chapter 28 and verse 39? Depicted in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8 over here, what are those righteous actions? 
Hallelujah. And those righteous actions are depicted in Matthew chapter 25. You all know the story. The story of the ten virgins. Hallelujah. Five were wise and five were foolish. The righteous actions of the five wise virgins will pass for fine linen tunic over here. Let's look at it. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 1. It says, At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So they are the brides. Hallelujah. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their, took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in their jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed, to, and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. They may not, there may not be enough for both of us. And you instead go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with them, with him, to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came in and said, Sir, they said, Please open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I do not know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day and the hour that the Son of Man is going to come. That's your answer right there. So the righteous actions that the bride of Jesus need to imbibe as a fine linen tunic right now will be the wisdom of the five wise virgins to keep your lamps burning even in the season of darkness. Hallelujah. So fine linen tunic is going to be equivalent to the bride's righteous actions. The bride's righteous actions will be equivalent to the wisdom strategies of the five wise virgins in Matthew chapter 25. So that lets us know that fine linen tunic will be equivalent to the wisdom to keep your lamp burning even in the season of darkness. Three equations over there that I call the tunic equations. The first equation, fine lean and tunic, is going to be equivalent to the bride's righteous actions. The bride's righteous actions, equation number two, is going to be equivalent to the wisdom strategies of the wise virgins. Since equation one is going to be equivalent to equation two, then you can say that the fine lean and tunic, the spiritual implication of fine lean and tunic, is going to be equivalent to the wisdom strategies that you need to employ so your lamp doesn't go out in the season of darkness or the wisdom strategies that you need to employ so that you are not naked in the things of the spirit or so the devil doesn't get your purchase just like we've been talking about. So just to let you guys know, the spiritual implication of the tunic again, documented based on the evidence of Revelation chapter 19, and one of those wisdom strategies that the that God will recommend that you operate in on a regular basis is going to be going on your Sabbath. Hallelujah. Going on your Sabbath is going to be one of the spiritual principles, one of those wisdom strategies that you need to imbibe. So what is your Sabbath? A Sabbath is a day that you dedicate in a week or a year that you dedicate in seven years to revive your will, the will components of the human soul. And that's going to be based on the evidence of scriptures like Exodus chapter 16 and verse 23, Exodus chapter 20, verse, verse 8, and Exodus chapter 23, verse 10. And we're going to turn first into Exodus chapter 23. The first mention of the word Sabbath in the Bible uh, was in Exodus chapter 16, rather. Exodus chapter 16 and verse 23. Hallelujah. Your Sabbath rest. It is, it is important to understand that going on the Sabbath is one of the wisdom strategies 
that you are going to employ as a wise virgin to keep your lamp burning even in the season of darkness. They are one of, it's going to be one of the layers of righteousness that you need to add to your operation to protect your status of obedience, perfect obedience, which your status of perfect obedience is going to be uh, your lean and undergarment. Like that we talked about several weeks ago. Uh, Exodus chapter 16. Let's take a look at that. Exodus chapter 16 and verse 23. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. Glory, 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 glory. Actually, I'm going to start right now. And in verse... Uh, glory to God. In verse... 17 says the Israelites did as they were told some gathered much some little and when they measured it by by Orma he will gather much did not have too much and he will gather little did not have too little each one gathered as much as he needed talking about the manner um, back in the wilderness then Moses said to them no one is to keep any of it until the morning However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept some part of it until the morning, but he was full of maggots and began to smell, so Moses was angry with them. Verse 21, each morning everyone gathered as much as he needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much to armors for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses, and he said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake, and boil what you want to boil, and save whatever is left until the morning. So they saved it until the morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. It says, eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, uh, there will not be any. Hallelujah. The word of God says in here that I'm establishing an ordinance that we can call a Sabbath for you guys over here. Six days you are going to work for the food you're going to eat. But on the seventh day, I don't want you working. I want you to conserve that time, to repurpose that time that you normally will have spent working to focus on rejuvenating your will, to rejuvenate the decision, your result to carry on with the, with the promises of the word of God. Hallelujah. So that's the first mention of the word Sabbath in the Bible, Exodus chapter 16. And let's look at another account of the Sabbath in Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 in verse 8. Hallelujah. That's one of the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses in, in the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 20, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to, by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, neither you, nor your sons or daughters, nor your man servants, maid servants, or your animals, nor the aliens living in your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the seas and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Hallelujah. So God says in here, the reason I'm telling you guys to appreciate the Sabbath is because that's the way I operated when I recreated this planet, when I recreated the whole universe. It says uh, God worked for six days and on the seventh day he went ahead and he, he rested a little bit. Now, we know the word rest over there. Some people took it uh, to the extreme and they lost the spiritual import of it. But Jesus was trying to tell them that the Father still works even up until now. So the word rested over there is a cyclical rest. So God is going to work for six days and on the seventh day he's going to replenish and rejuvenate himself. And then he's going to start working 
working again on the eighth day, on the ninth day, on the, on the tenth day, and he's going to go for the next six days, and on the seventh day, he's going to rest. So God establishes a pattern of working for six days, and on the seventh day, you are going to rest to retune your will, to rejuvenate your will, to realign your will in the direction of hope of the Christian calling, to revitalize, to rejuvenate. That's the purpose of the Sabbath. Hallelujah. And God was trying to get the people of Israel to, to understand how to do that. And the people of Israel lost the spiritual import of the Sabbath. And they passed the ordinance without the spiritual import of the ordinance down to their generation. Down from one generation to another until the time they got to the generation of Yahushua over 2,000 years ago. That they completely forgot the spirit behind the, the Sabbath. The spirit behind the Sabbath is to repurpose the time you would have used technically to, to go work for food, to prepare food and all that. Use that time to strengthen your resolve for the God of Israel. But by the time they got to Jesus, the, the, the dispensation of Jesus, they got so much uh, confused about the concept of the Sabbath that they wouldn't want even anybody to get healed on the Sabbath. And Jesus will go ahead and heal somebody on the Sabbath and they're going to get mad at Jesus and Yahushua is going to correct that, that uh, theology and tell them that you need to do good on the Sabbath. God's not telling you not to do good on your Sabbath. In fact, the reason God established the Sabbath for you is so that you can seize opportunities to practice uh, the gift of the Spirit and walk in love toward your neighbors. That's the reason God established Sabbath, the Sabbath, for example, um, just to start with, to remove all the distractions away from your mind so you can focus on spiritual activities. That's the reason for the Sabbath. But by the time they got to the dispensation of Jesus, they had completely lost the spiritual import of the Sabbath. And God's going to try to get the spiritual implications back to us by the grace of God. Let's look at another scripture in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 10. Talking about how God even plans for them to go on a Sabbath once every seven years. In Exodus chapter 23 and verse 10, it says, For six years you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops. But during the seventh year, let the land lie unplowed and unused. Then the poor among your people may get food from it. The wild animals may eat what they leave. Do the same for your vineyard and your olive groves. Six days do your work, but on the seventh day do not work, so that your ox and your donkey may rest, the slave born in your household, and the alien as well may be refreshed. Be careful to do everything I have said to you today. The spirit of the Sabbath is rejuvenation. It is being refreshed, refreshed spiritually, refreshed emotionally, refreshed in your soul and in your body. Be rejuvenated. The Sabbath is going is to involve denying oneself of legitimate pleasures, not doing as you please on God's holy day. And that's one of the wisdom strategies of Yahushua over 2,000 years ago to help him to keep his linen tunic really white. Hallelujah. It's another layer of righteousness that you need to add to your operation concerning the things of the Spirit. And we touched on it last week as one of the instructions I gave you guys to maintain your status in positive 4 and positive 5. Scripture in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 58, talks about denying oneself of legitimate pleasure or your routine activities that are not necessarily seen. Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 58 and in verse 3, it says, Why have we fasted, they said, and they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you've not noticed it? Uh, hallelujah. And he says, yet on the day that you fast, you do as you please and you exploit all your workers. 
You're fasting ants and quarreling and strife and striking each other with wicked feasts. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on I. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it not? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what I call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide uh, the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood, then your lights will, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I challenge everybody to read through Isaiah chapter 58 much later. It is denying one's self of legitimate pleasure, not doing as you please on the Lord's holy day, fasting to humble your soul. It's a day to do good, being about the Father's business exclusively. So we live in a generation that we live in the hustle and the bustle of uh, the Monday to, to Friday. You're going to do a job which God calls you to do that job because God wants you to work with your own hands. So you can you can eat. The Bible says he does he who doesn't work should, shouldn't eat. But there needs to come a time during your Sabbath that you devote yourself exclusively to spiritual matters so you can be rejuvenated. That's what the Sabbath is all about. And we talked about how God himself went, went on his Sabbath after recreating the universe before he started his work all over again. And when you want to go on a Sabbath, you typically want to fast something that you normally enjoy, which is not sin. You can fast food. You can fast the working on the computer. You can fast doing your chores on your Sabbath or any other thing that is legitimate that literally took a lot of your time from Monday to Saturday or from Monday to Friday or whatever. So those things that take about five, six hours of your time, in our case, the contemporary uh, work life, it takes about 10 to 12 hours of our time every day. You want to repurpose those 10 to 12 hours on your Sabbath for spiritual activities to retune your will, to rededicate yourself to the things of the Spirit. So why did God create the concept of a Sabbath? I've touched on the reasons left, right, and center uh, coming to talking about 20, 25 minutes right now. But let's look at the reasons in a logical se sequence. Yahushua fasted weekly to provide covering for his disciples. And mature believers are expected to do this for the people coming along at least once every week or as frequently as necessary based on milestone checks. Something that Jesus had to do once every week to provide covering for the people that were under him. Which scripture says that? Let's look at Mark chapter 2. We're looking at one of the wisdom strategies of Jesus right now to keep your lean in, tunic really wide. Mark chapter 2. Bless the name of Jesus. Glory, glory to God. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. In verse 18, Mark chapter 2 and verse 18, it says, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? And Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so as long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and on that day, they will fast. Jesus didn't say on that day they might fast. He said on that day, they will fast. And if you read the story just like I read right now, you'll understand that Yahushua was the one doing the fasting while it was over here 2,000 years ago. He was the one going on the Sabbath. He was the one doing all the spiritual activities. Why? Because Peter, James, and John didn't know how to do that yet. They say, I'm going to do that for you guys so to provide covering for you. But when I get out of here, then you guys need to learn how to do that for all the people. 
So one of the very first critical reasons it's important to go on the Sabbath is because of that, so that we can fast to provide covering for people. And the fact that you're fasting does not necessarily mean uh, that uh, you, you're going you're gonna to fast food. You can fast all the things that's taking your time. We, we saw based on the evidence of the book of Exodus over there that actually what, what God told them to fast back in the book of Exodus was not necessarily not eating. He's just talking about the time it's going to take to gather that food and to prepare that food. I want you to fast that time. Collect twice as much on the sixth day. Bring it to your house. Bake what needs to be baked and boil what needs to be boiled. Because on the seventh day, I don't want you guys cooking. I don't want you guys working for food. I don't want you to dedicate and repurpose that time that you are going to use to prepare your meals. Repurpose that time for spiritual activities. And I know that over time, going on the Sabbath has morphed into uh, total abstinence from food. And if food is going to cost you a lot of time and a lot of hours, that's okay. You can stay away from it. And sometimes you may need to fast food extensively just to, just to allow certain things in your body to digest properly. That's okay. But do not lose the spiritual import of it. The spiritual import of going on a Sabbath or going on a fast is so that you can dedicate time. Dedicate time for spiritual activities. If you fast food, but you still have no time to listen to your ODP messages to retune your wheel, you have no time to pray the kingdom through on the Sabbaths for the Sabbath scriptures that we talked about. You haven't gone on a Sabbath the Lord's way. Keep the spiritually important of it. We're looking at the, the reasons we need to go on the Sabbath right now. So Yahushua fasted weekly to, pro to provide covering for his disciples. And it is important for mature believers to learn how to do that as well for them. And in verse 23, for all the believers, uh, in verse, 20, uh, verse 23 of Mark chapter 2, uh, Jesus literally confirms that when you're going on the Sabbath, I'm not necessarily asking my disciples to, do, to, to, to go on the Sabbath right now, nor does it mean that on the Sabbath you're not supposed to eat anything. In verse 23, it says, on one Sabbath, Yahushua was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to them, look, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? So back in the time of Jesus, they had completely lost the spiritual import of the Sabbath ordinance that was given in Exodus chapter 23, which talks about fasting the time it's going to take for you to prepare your food not necessarily fasting your food. So the back of their minds on the Sabbath right now, when they think about the Sabbath, it's all about not eating anything. But that's not what God said in Exodus chapter 16 and verse 23. God told them to collect two portions on the sixth day so that on the seventh day they are not going to have to go, go outside and work for the food. They would have had, had it baked in their houses, bald in their houses, so on the seventh day they can eat it without being distracted with the with the with the with the activities of trying to work for food. That's the spiritual import of the Sabbath. But the guys over here during the time of Jesus had completely lost that spiritual import and they completely abstain from food when they are trying to go on the Sabbath. And I'm not saying abstaining from food when you want to go on the Sabbath is technically wrong. I'm just talking about the fact that you need to understand the spiritual import of it is to repurpose the time you are going to use to prepare food for spiritual activities. If it takes you about three to four hours to prepare your breakfast... It's going to take about three or four hours to prepare your lunch and three hours to, pre to prepare your dinner. Repurpose those nine hours exclusively for ODP messages. Repurpose those nine hours and part of it for praying for sanctification of scriptures and praying through one hour, two hours, three hours. Repurpose all that time to do the study of the Word of God, reading your Bible from the Old Testament and New Testament. Repurpose all that time for spiritual activities. That's the spirit spiritual import of the Sabbath. Verse 24 of Mark chapter 2 says, The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? 
And he answered, Have you never heard, never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priest to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. And Jesus is trying to straighten out their theology a little bit. Let them understand that the whole idea of going on the Sabbath is not necessarily for you to abstain from eating. I'm talking about you repurposing that time. It's going to take you to work for food and repurpose that time for spiritual activities. Rejuvenate your will and fly back out for the next six days. That's the purpose of the Sabbath. We're looking at why we need to go on the Sabbath right now. So that you can have dedicated time that you can use for spiritual activities just like Yahushua did to provide covering for the people coming along with you. Hallelujah. Now the reason you need to do that is to realign your will after dissipating spiritual energy for six days in a week. The word of God says those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Let's look at that in Isaiah chapter 40. Glory to God. In verse 28, it says, Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow weary or tired, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weak, and increases the powers of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, young men stumble and fall. But those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. The word waiting on the Lord over there, our generation really doesn't understand it. But generations prior to our generation understand the import of waiting on the Lord. When you're talking about waiting on the Lord over there, you're talking about going on your Sabbath or exclusive time that you are going to be in the presence of the Lord exclusively. That's what it means to wait on the Lord. The Bible says when you do that, you are going to mount on wings like eagles. You are going to run and not be weary. You are going to walk and not faint. That's one of the reasons you need to go on the Sabbath. You want to rejuvenate your strength like an eagle. And if you do a little research about an eagle, you will find that an eagle actually has a time that he or she goes on the Sabbath. It's going to come in a place and it's going to just stay by itself. And nobody's it's not going to mind. It's not going to talk to anybody. And after that, his strength is going to come back and he's going to fly back up again. That's the reason God created the Sabbath for you, because that's the way he himself operates. God has cyclical patterns with which he operates. Just like he created the universe in six days and on the seventh day he rested, he's doing the same thing up until now. Yahushua confirmed all that. So the fact that God rested on the seventh day as documented in the book of Genesis does not mean that God is in a state of his head forever. He's not completely numb and jobless. No. He's going to pick it up again and work the first day, the second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, and on the seventh day, he's going to rest again. Then he's going to come back up. Well, day number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, he's going to rest again. Then he's going to come back again. Why is he doing that? Because he is renewing his strength like the eagles. Because when you're working, Doing your work that God has called you to do legitimate activities for the past, for the next six days, you are dissipating spiritual energy. Even if you're not stumbling into milestone negative four or anything like that, you are dissipating spiritual energy. Spiritual energy, working as a, as a scientist, spiritual energy, working as an engineer, spiritual energy, working as a lawyer, working as a, as a banker, or whatever you're doing, even working with your children, working grocery shopping, doing all those things, spiritual energy being dissipated every time. But you need to find a time for you to come back and just rejuvenate yourself a little bit. Hallelujah. Why do we need to go on the Sabbath? To, re, to, to re, realign the wheel after dissipated spiritual energy six days in a week. And now the reason we need to go on a Sabbath is to make a U-turn away from negative milestones 
if we find ourselves in a negative milestone. And sometimes you made it to go on the Sabbath before your, 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 your normal Sabbath day on a weekend or something like that, depending on the challenges of the week. So you're just seeing there's lots of challenges going on right now. It seems like uh, the devil is trying to is trying to try to box me and corner me up. Pull back and go on the Sabbath. You're spiritually sick right now. Pull back and go on the Sabbath and expose yourself to the pharmacist section of the Word of God. And pull back before things start breaking and go on the Sabbath quickly. Your spiritual intelligence is going to kick in right now. So I'm trying to fly out of negative three and I can't just get out of it. I'm trying my best possible to overcome carnal mind, the carnal will, temptations, but they're not just leaving me. That's a time to go on the Sabbath because you're sick right now. You're spiritually sick. Pull back and go on the Sabbath. You can make a U-turn by going on the Sabbath. Hallelujah. Another reason which we talked about before to go on the Sabbath is to do good and concentrate on spiritual activities. The Word of God talks about that in Mark chapter 3 and verse 1, from verse 1 to verse 6. Another reason to go on the Sabbath is so that your righteousness will appear and the glory of God will be your rear guard. Hallelujah. So when you renew your strength the way God wants you to renew your strength, the Bible says the glory of the Lord will go before you. Um, your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. So you got God in front of you, God behind you, and you are straddled, straddled in between the presence of the Lord. Righteousness in front of you, glory of the Lord coming before you. What's the implication of that? The implication of that is that you, your prayers are going to be speedily answered. The glory of the Lord is going to be there. Your righteousness is going to be there. Righteousness is going to go before you. That's the reason Sabbath, going on the Sabbath, is another layer of righteousness. And that's based on Isaiah chapter 58 in verse 6 to 8. We talked about that before. Let's look at it again. Bless the name of Jesus, Isaiah chapter 50, 58 and from verse 6 and talking, talking about how your light will break forth like the noon day. In Isaiah 58 and verse 6, it says, Is not this the kind of fasting I've chosen to lose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry, to provide the poor wanderer for, with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe him and to turn away from your, and not to turn away from your own flesh. Then your light will break forth like the dawn. Your healing will appear quickly. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Hallelujah. So one of the ways you can sustain the operation of your righteousness is to go on a Sabbath. Your righteousness is going to go before you. The glory of the Lord is going to be your, going to be your rear guard before you call. He's going to answer, answer speedily. One of the reasons we need to go on a Sabbath. Another reason we need to go on a Sabbath, uh, based on the evidence of Psalm 35 in verse 23, is to humble the soul. Critical reason. Let's turn to that scripture in Psalm 35. Go on a Sabbath, the Lord's way. Repurpose those times uh, that you would have spent doing legitimate activities that are taking your time and, and your attention away from God, that have the potential of doing that. Repurpose all that time for spiritual activities and fast what you normally will have pleasure in. Psalm 35 in verse 23. Hallelujah. Uh, let me see right here. In verse 13, rather. Psalm 35 in verse 13. It says, Yet when they were healed, I put my sackcloth on, and I humbled myself with fasting, when my prayers returned to me un unanswered. So the Bible says, I can humble my soul with fasting over here. What does that mean? The soul. Especially the will components of the soul. Uh, if you don't go on a Sabbath, it's going to move in the direction of arrogance and pride and wanting to do what you want to please everyone, wanting to do what you're pleased with every time. But you spend a day of your seven day week and say, I am not going to do what I normally would have done for the past six days right now. I am going to humble my will. Hallelujah. 
And when you humble your will, the Bible says it's going to give grace to the humble. And it's going to give you more spiritual energy so you can carry on. So you want to notate that reason, very critical reason, to practice humility from our will. I've got to go on the Sabbath, the Lord's way. Another reason to go on the Sabbath is to sanctify you, which the Bible talks about in Exodus chapter 31. Hallelujah. This is your sanctification, the Bible talks about. That's the reason we found a couple of sanctification scriptures that you need to exercise your faith in on your Sabbath on purpose. Exodus chapter 31. Glory to God. Let's go for it. Exodus 31 and verse 12. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, You must observe my Sabbaths. So there are many Sabbaths. We so saw there is a Sabbath for the week. There is a Sabbath for seven years. There are many Sabbaths. You must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come so you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you that anyone who desecrates my Sabbath must be put to death. Anyone who does any work on that day must be cut off from his people. For six days work is to be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath must be put to death. The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for, for, uh, for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and you, between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he abstained from working and rested. When the Lord finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him two tablets of, tablets of the testimony, the tablet of stone inscribed by the fingers of God. So God's really, really serious about this stuff. And we don't see anybody stoned in the, in the New Testament anymore. But it is important to realize that if you refuse to go on the Sabbath, things are going to start dying systematically in your spiritual operations. Because you're literally just burning out. You're not giving time to renew and rejuvenate your strength like the eagle. That's what God's talking about over there, the spiritual implication of it. So things do not start dying in your life. Go on a Sabbath. Rejuvenate your will. Rejuvenate your resolve. Rejuvenate your status of perfect obedience so the devil doesn't get your bridges. Go on your Sabbath because of that, because the Lord sanctifies you through that exercise. Another reason we need to go on the Sabbath is to increase the capacity, your capacity to receive the grace of God, and so that God can lift you up in due time. And that's based on the evidence of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5, which is God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. So if going on a Sabbath, the Lord's way is going to humble me, then guess what that, that exercise is going to do? That exercise is going gonna, is gonna to keep me open to the grace of God, which God's going to be using to lift me up in due time. You know, the grace of God is your spiritual energy. The Bible says it's important for the human heart to be strengthened by grace, just like the physical body is strengthened by physical food. So anything that's going to keep you increasing from grace to grace, you've got to take special notice of that. Because you need all the grace that you can get to be able to stand tall when gross darkness covers the world and gross darkness to people. You need grace. The way you're going to get grace is going on the side of the Lord's way once a week. Hallelujah. Um, another reason which we touched on before is speedy answers to prayers due to increased righteousness quotient right now because your strength is part, your Sabbath is part of your spiritual tunic of righteousness. Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 9 talks about speedy answers to prayers. It says, before you call, I'm going to answer. Righteousness is going to go before you. The glory of the Lord is going to be your rear guard. I'm talking about elevated actions of righteousness right now. So when you cultivate a habit of going on the Sabbath, the Lord's way, you will get more grace in your life. As a result of that, you are going to be sharper in the things of the Spirit and speedy answers. That's what it means to have the glory of the Lord, your rear guard. What he means is anywhere you are, there is a manifestation of the power of God. There is a manifestation of the presence of the Lord right in there because you're going on your Sabbath. 
Hallelujah. The Sabbath will ensure that your fine linen tunic is intact to get you ready as a bride of Yahushua, based on the evidence of Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6 to 9, which we touched on when we started. Exodus chapter 28 and verse 39. Revelation chapter 3 from verse 1 to 5, talking about the church in Sardis. Fine linen tunic is going to be equivalent to the bride's righteous actions to prepare herself for the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's based on Revelation chapter 19 from verse 6 to 9. We're talk, touched on that. That's equation number one of the tunic equations that we just talked about. The bride's righteous actions will be equivalent to the wisdom strategies to keep your lamp burning, even in the season of darkness. And that means that the fine lean and tuning will be equivalent to wisdom strategies that you need to operate. And those one of those wisdom strategies is to go on your Sabbath. So how do we do it? How do we go on a Sabbath? Pretty much implied based on the instructions we've been reading right now in the book of Exodus. Carve out one day in a week that you can exclusively intensely for a, for a number of hours. It doesn't mean you have to go into the woods, but it just means that the time you use in cooking, don't spend that time cooking. And some of us are still working on this because we have little children and things like that. That's understandable. But to the best of your ability, uh, believe God for, 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 for practical strategies to repurpose those times for spiritual activities. Get something playing in the background and, and leave the cell phone for just a little bit or whatever. Distraction of the cell phone. Use your cell phone as a, as a media or plain, plain word messages or something like that. How do we do it in practical terms? Evaluate your milestones during your Sabbath and activate appropriate repentance strategies. So if I find right now that I'm on uh, day number seven of the week, and I'm getting close to milestone negative two, that I am going to go back to the tunic of righteousness message part three and identify repentance strategies over there, or part two rather, identify repentance strategies over there, keep those repentance strategies during my Sabbath on purpose in emotion. We're talking about the wisdom strategies, which will be your fine linen tunic right now of your Sabbath. Evaluate your milestones during your Sabbath and activate the appropriate repentance strategies. Exercise complete faith principles to retune your will and rejuvenate all your members, spirit, soul, and body, based on scriptures like 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Philippians 2.13, and Romans 8.11. Let's look at those scriptures. Cardinal scriptures that you can use to retune your members. You're going to desire the scriptures, and pray the scriptures, believe those scriptures, confess the scriptures, meditate the scriptures, do those scriptures. First Thessalonians 5.23, what do you do on your Sabbath? Glory to God. In verse 23 of First Thessalonians 5, it says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless, blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. The word of God says that your spirit, your soul, your body needs to be, need to be blameless at the coming of Yahushua, Hamashiach. And the one who called you is faithful and he's going to do it. You can take that scripture and you desire that scripture. Say, God, I want my spirit to be blameless. I want my soul and my body to be blameless. My mind, my will, my emotions. And you desire that scripture. You pray that scripture using the, the instructions of the faith of a priest. And you go to God. Say, God, sanctify my will today. When you come out of that session, your will is going to be brandished new again. To serve God for the next seven days. And now the scripture is Philippians chapter 2. Hallelujah. It says in verse 13, 4, it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good, good purpose. So that verse of scripture, you can take, take it to God. Say, God is going to be interested in working in my will. God's not just going to be making me to obey the word of God, but it says, I am going to work in your will to make you to be willing to obey the word of God. Hallelujah. So I'm going to pray that scripture. I'm going to desire that scripture. Pray that scripture. Believe God for that scripture. My will is going to be straightened up just like that. Sanctified. 
Romans 8 and verse 11. It says, if the spirit of him who raised Yahushua from the dead is living on the inside of you, he who raised Yahushua from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Why? So your body can feel the same force of righteousness that is felt in your spirit because the body is dead because of sin. The spirit is alive because of righteousness. I can believe God for that scripture to sanctify my body, make my body feel the same force of righteousness. So my body is trying to feel like I don't want to do things. I don't want to pray anymore. I don't, blah, blah, blah. All those feelings in the body, you change it. Now you exercise faith in this kind of scriptures on your Sabbath. You got to do that. Once every week, you got to do that. At least once every week or as frequently as you need based on the challenges in your contemporary situation and circumstances. Those three scriptures really important. Exercise complete faith principles to retune your members based on 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Philippians, Philippians 2.13, Romans 8.11. And then, of course, after that, you want to switch into the confess meditation mode by exposing your mind to messages, especially the pharmacist section of the ODP. Because that talks ex exclusively about repairing the dysfunctions of dishonesty and arrogance and pride, which will close the door to the grace and the mercy of God. You want to make sure you're staying as wide open as possible to the grace that you can get in your world, to the mercy you can get in your world. So I want to make sure my honesty, humility, and faith are increasing. And I'm going to monitor that as exclusively on my Sabbath. You do that in the pharmacy section of the ODP. I recommend that you listen at least to one pharmacy, pharmacy message of the ODP on your Sabbath. Then afterwards, you can do your milk. Afterward, you can do your meat. But pharmacy, a must on your Sabbath. Really important. And then after that, you can fast. Take a break from food or any other thing that takes a lot of time, a lot of your time, and repurpose that time for spiritual activities. If you're nursing a child, I don't recommend you fasting, for example, because your baby needs food. But rather than spending five, six hours preparing uh, some other kind of food, uh, you can you can believe God for ways to, to repurpose that those hours so you can uh, concentrate on your ODP messages a little bit and let God work with you and find out what is taking your, your uh, 60, 70 percent of your time from Monday to Tuesday, from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday to Thursday to Friday to Saturday. Find out what's taking so much time of your waking hours and taking your attention away from spiritual activities or the quality of your spiritual activities. Find out what that is and fast that exercise. You fast that activity. In my case, it's going to be working a job about 12 hours a day. So I spend about three hours in traffic, annoying Houston traffic. And I spend about nine hours working. So that's 12 hours every day. That's taking the bulk of my waking hours. So what am I going to do on my Sabbath? I'm going to fast working. I'm going to take a break a little bit from working. I'm going to fast working on the computer. And I'm going to play my ODP messages. And I'm going to exercise faith specifically for those sanctification scriptures I'm talking about. And I'm coming out after, after Sunday, after Saturday, after Sunday. I am coming out like the eagle with rejuvenated strength. And my strength is going to be there Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. A little bit getting low. Then I go back on my Sabbath and I pick myself back up again. That's your tunic of righteousness. It will sustain your operation of perfect obedience and cover you up like the linen tunic of the Old Testament. Hallelujah. On your Sabbath, you want to do good on the Sabbath by seizing opportunities to practice the powers of agape for agape in motion activities. Simultaneous displays of kindness, of righteousness, and of justice. You are going to be on the lookout for those kind of things. To sharpen you up a little bit. What am I talking about? I'm talking about going on your Sabbath. It's part of your tunic. What is your tunic? Those are wisdom strategies that will protect your status of perfect obedience. So the truth of God kind of love. And Sabbath is, is one of those. 
One of those wisdom strategies that Jesus operated in, he understood the spiritual import of the Sabbath is not necessarily staying away from food. It is staying away from distractions, from spiritual activities and repurposing the time that the distractions have been taken for the past six days for spiritual activities exclusively on your Sabbath. That's what he's talking about. And as you become financially independent and God helps even during your, your current schedules, you need to fast a year. And I'm believing God for that as my schedule gets better and God gives us financial independence. There is going to be a year exclusively that you are not going to do anything secular. Once every seven years. You are going to do exclusively just waking up and listening to messages. Waking up and listening to messages. Oh, seems like you're going to starve if you do that. Well, if you have a lot for the past six years, you're not going to starve because that's what God promised us. And we're believing God for that as well. God recommends that you do that. And when you do all those things, you will appreciate that in the season of darkness, you can be the five wise virgins that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 25. You will appreciate that it is possible to stay afloat above the darkness of the world, even in the season of darkness. When you start operating as wisdom strategies, you will start to realize this is how Yahushua did it. And he stayed faithful to the testimony of the Christian purpose for 33.5 years because of this wisdom strategies that we are uncovering in the tunic of righteousness. You go learn how to do that. How to learn how to do that. And by the grace of God, we are learning how to do that in ODP. Bless the name of Jesus. So this is how to go on your Sabbath. Carve out a day of your week to do these spiritual activities. Evaluate your milestones during your Sabbath and exercise or activate appropriate repentance strategies based on what you've been taught. Exercise complete faith principles to retune your will and rejuvenate the strength of your will, your spirit, your soul, and your body based on the sanctification scriptures. Expose your mind to the sincere milk or the sincere pharmacy and milk and, and meat section of the word of God. Fast or take a break from food or any other thing that normally takes a lot of your time. Seize opportunities to do POA for AIM. Why do we need to go on the Sabbath? Because Yahushua recommends you need to do that so you can provide covering for the people coming before you, coming behind you. Mature believers need to do that so they can concentrate on how to generate spiritual energies to protect the people under their covering. To realign your will after dissipating the spiritual energy for the next, for the past six days. To make a huge turn away from the, from the negative milestones. To do good and concentrate on spiritual activities so your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord or answers to your prayers will come right behind you. To humble the will component of your soul. To sanctify you. To increase your capacity to receive the grace of God. Speedy answers to your prayers. The Sabbath will ensure that your fine linen is intact to guard your linen undergarment to get you ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Those are reasons that uh, I believe some of you have taken notes of those. And what is the Sabbath? It is dedicating a, a day in a week or a year out of seven years to revive your will, the will component of your soul, denying yourself of legitimate pleasures, not doing as you please, Humbling your soul on your Sabbath, it's a day for spiritual activities exclusively. So that's what your Sabbath and your Sabbath rest is. And the scripture that talks about how important it is to make sure that you do this so that you can enter into rest is going to be in the book of Hebrews. I think I'm going to try to close with that. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Hallelujah. Um, Hebrews chapter 4, rather. He, Hebrews chapter 4 it says, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have heard, we, we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. And I'm going to go right now to in verse 6. It says, it still remains that some will enter that rest. And those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not enter uh, because of their disobedience. Therefore, God again sets a certain day, calling it today. A, a long time later, he's speaking through David. 
For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his works, just like God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by the standard of disobedience. So when you operate the Sabbath principles every day, you are going to end rest. What we're talking about entering rest does not necessarily mean that you're not going to work anymore. But what, it, what, it, what you're talking about is you are going to maintain your status of positive four and positive five for the rest of your life. Because you understand how to operate cyclically like the way God operates cyclically. So on the outside, it just looks like you're never down. Because you understand how to, to work and then rejuvenate your strength. And then you come back again, you work and rejuvenate your strength. You're going to stay airborne forever. Why? That's the Sabbath rest. The operation of getting into rest and the things of the spirit so the devil doesn't make incursions to your circumstances. A little bit over here, a little bit over there, then he comes back and makes incursions to your circumstances. The way to do that, to mitigate the impact of the devil and the adversary, is to understand how to operate cyclically the way God himself operates cyclically. That's what Hebrews chapter 4 is talking about and he calls the Sabbath rest. Your rest. In the things of the spirit will depend, will be based on you understanding how to go on a Sabbath to rejuvenate your strength. Every week, once every seven years or something like that's the best of your ability to learn how to be like an eagle to rejuvenate your strength so you can enter rest. The devil is not going to be able to make incursions to your circumstances because all holes are closed to the adversary. Now you have your Sabbath rest because you are doing it the Lord's way. Hallelujah. So I'm going to like to stop over there by the grace of God. And I want to give the viewing audience an opportunity to take a snapshot of what's on the board right now. So you're welcome to pause the device that you may be working with and take a snapshot of the notes on the board so you can study along with us. For the people on the distribution of 2017-2018 ODP, you are going to get um, access to the study notes so you can study along with us. So, so feel free. You're welcome right now to pause the video and take a snapshot of the study notes on the board. And I'll be back in 10 seconds. Seconds. Oh, glory to glory, glory to Jesus, glory, glory to the Lord. So I want to believe, I believe that you've gotten a chance to take uh, a copy of the study notes on the board. And this is uh, going to be the conclusion of the tunic of righteousness by the grace of God with your Sabbath rest. And I say be blessed in the name of Yahushua. Amen.